of something superior to itself. Education is not going to save us, no matter how many universities we build. But there is something in the university that can help us to outgrow the university. And that is the thing we are greatly concerned with. We have today great schools of science. We have a new age of computers that is already short-circuiting itself. We have all kinds of advancements that we boast of, including munitions. But none of these things have any permanent value and have no foundation in truth. The truth of the matter is that all material things exist for two purposes alone. The basic purpose being to preserve the continuity of material existence and the second to outgrow it. And without these two working together, we're in very bad shape. Now, to get the thing back on its feet again, we have to restore the concept that the great moving power of creation, as we know it, is love. Without love, nothing will work. Without love, true love, nothing can be truly accomplished. And what we have generally regarded as affection or love is for the most part too diluted, too weak, and too inadequate to fulfill its own purpose. Therefore, the only basis of international understanding is mutual affection. The only way of preventing divorces from running away with mankind is affection. An affection, of course, based upon a certain experience the uh, things that happen to us are intended to be a continuing, unrolling scroll of learning. Every day we learn something. And now, every day that we learn something, we promptly forget anything we don't want to know or never bother to take consideration of it. We are working on a mental level, and this mental level is getting us into one difficulty after another because the mind is useless unless it is warmed by the love principle within it. With wisdom without love is fallacy. Strength without compassion is fallacy. Learning without love or without leading to a greater faith in realities is empty. There's nothing to it. And we are living on this surface of this emptiness every day of our lives and trying to make it seem as though it was important and useful. So if in the next few years, which it seems quite reasonable, there will be a continual unfolding of the significance of the feminine principle in life, that it is going to be restored to the dignities which it once held for long periods of time until the human being became too intellectual and lost contact with reality. This means also, however, that the ad advancement of the feminine part of society depends upon some thoughtfulness, some consideration, and some realization of significance. Instead of assuming that this can be accomplished by the uh, woman taking on the mental attitudes of the man, it is not going to work. Because if it worked for, if it worked for her, it would have worked for him, and it didn't. <laughs> the more she becomes a man, in thinking and living and competing, the more certain she is to, lay, to contribute to the common ruin. This is not her province. Her province is not to copy, but to originate. It's not to do what has been done by men, but to do what only a woman could do, has done, and can do again. It is a tremendous challenge in which a half of human life has become aware, or is becoming aware, of its absolutely indispensable part in survival. That it actually, that the survival of humanity rests firmly upon the feminine phase of the human race. Now this means we've got to do something to try to point out these values and not allow them to be drifted along until it is too late to use their emphasis. It should be definite that actually every opportunity should be given and taken to acquaint the, the women of the women of the world with their spiritual responsibilities and opportunities 
the social leadership and even their political leadership. A political leadership which perhaps like the League of the Iroquois permits them to appoint their representatives or be their representatives themselves. But the main problem is to keep the heart power dominant. Love and love alone can solve this problem. Nothing else can. Faith can be strengthened by love and love can strengthen faith. Peace can be aroused by faith or become apparent through love and through kindness. Kindness was a, a very great power in ancient thinking and we now consider it largely as a feminine virtue. But kindness is, according to Buddhism, is the next world teacher. The next world teacher is the Bodhisattva Maitreya. And the word Maitreya means kind or kindness. And it looks awfully much as though there is something very deep and mysterious in this ancient concept that was given to the world over 2,000 years ago that the universal savior of the future must be kindness. Power, skill, war, no. But a kindness which causes the individual to have an enduring sympathy for the needy. Kindness which means to turn away all wrath. Kindness which means to be ever aware of the needs of each other. And ever forgiving of each other and ever mindful of our own need for improvement. All of these things sum up into what we might term a feminine dominance. Now this feminine dominance can to some degree certainly be shared equally by all men because a man has perfect capacity to be kind if he wants to. He can be thoughtful. He can be affectionate. He can be uh, considerate. He can be a good parent, a good marriage partner, and a good child. These things are not denied him in any sense of the word. He is perfectly capable of defending the best things in life. But when they come along and there is a challenge and there is a matter which requires or is assumed to require masculine prerogatives, let him forever remember that it is love in him that must solve, that it is not the privilege of the man to go out and fight. It is not even his need to fight for the defense of a woman because if man and women come to their proper relationship, there is no longer a conflict. Each one supports the other in its needs and fulfillments and does everything possible to advance the common good. So it's natural that the maternal instinct, which we all recognize and which goes on through life in most cases, Parents are thoughtful of their children for the most part throughout all the years of life. But in some mysterious way, life has crippled many of them. They are disillusioned. They are hurt. They have had uh, disappointments. They have been betrayed in many respects and ways and outraged. But there is still the great necessity of starting somewhere to put the thing back in order. And the place that, is, uh, that may all things have to begin is in the cradle. The beginning of the reformation of the world will not come from the top. It will not come from the great treaties which will be made and broken before the ink is dry. The great changes for the future begin in the cradle. They begin with a new relationship and a new understanding between child and parent a bringing up of the child in a present atmosphere, one of control, discipline, and affection. A parent actually able, through knowledge and insight, to bring to the child everything possible to enable it to become a law-abiding, lawful, and intelligent citizen. While these processes are on, the uh, elders of the tribe, so to say, will go on with their lawmaking and do the best they can, probably, to bring some kind of cosmos out of this chaos. But in the long run, it is a gentle, kindly, continuing strength of principles and ideals that must bring us through. 
we will never be able to find a peace that results from war. We will find a peace that results from the spreading of the peace in the human heart, and also a peace that is prescribed, recommended, and ordered by practically every religion of the world. These things also bear in mind the fact that from the earliest time religion has been primarily invested in women. Religion has become their instrument, and in uh, Christianity the number of canonized women is very considerable, and uh, many symbols and articles are related to women. The robes of the sibyls become the garments of the cardinals, and the, uh, the cardinals and the higher officials nearly always wear robes that are suggestive of the women of, in, of antiquity who were the oracles and the custodians of wisdom. So the churches, the mosques and the synagogues and the temples and the chapels and the shrines all have the same essential principle to work with. In every case, God has so loved humanity that it gave its only begotten Son to save the world. And that love of God is the mother of humanity. It is that love which is expressed and exemplified. Without that love, the act of creation would be sterile. But divinity has given the power of love to control all things. And the divinity itself is an androgynous unity. It is mother-father. It has to be both. It cannot be either alone. It is a power which is divided in us, but was a uni unity in the beginning, and must again ultimately be unified in creation. Everything in the end must be governed by perfect wisdom, re resulting in perfect love. All these things we sort of realize now, and we are reaching out and feeling for them in times of trouble, and wondering if something can be done about it. But I think something can be done about it, but it's going to take a little thought. And I think among the things it's going to take will be a very definite uh, acceptance by women of their divine birthright, of the right that they have to be, have a, mar a marvelous and protective power in the form of their leadership of mankind. Actually, as has been made many comic remarks about it, the average man is a rather helpless creature at best, and he's getting more so every day. He is becoming hopelessly involved in world affairs. He's trying to get a job and keep it. He is being pushed around by mechanization. He is being uh, uh, unemployed uh, through the corruptions of our economic system. He is a perturbed and disturbed creature. And he, in turn, needs a certain amount of insights. He has got to also find that in his heart and soul, there is only one thing that will ever bring him any peace, and that is that he will be able to put his own life in order, that he will be able to be the person that he would want to be if he could be. And to do this, he all, all he can do at the present time is to become a proper spirit in his own family, that he can share the responsibilities of that family, contribute in every way that he can to leadership in his own field, and to support the maternal growth of spiritual values in family life. He has the only things he can do at the moment, uh, really, basically, is to have faith in a divine power, and to have love for all he knows and all that he can do to help those for whom he has responsibility. These things he can do, but in some mysterious way, the gates of intuition, the mysterious power of leadership, is best developed in the feminine nature. Now, how would a woman go about to strengthen this particular factor in her own life? It becomes obvious that if she simply becomes a, a companion to a materialist, this is not going to do it. It also follows that if she follows with all the ambitions and, and uh, economic pressures that she has always carried, if she also is very success-centered, 
wants all the physical things that she can have, and things of this kind, something has to be sacrificed. And this sacrifice has been going on for a long time, and it's produced nothing. The, the main thing that the woman has to do is become better informed about the universal plan and the laws that govern it. To realize that her, her dignity in it has been neglected. That her conscious active participation in the fulfillment of the universal mystery has been uh, passed over too lightly. There is a responsibility in her that no man can ever carry. There is a responsibility in her that if she does not carry it, all humanity will suffer. Therefore, it is most important that her power be protected, that her vision be clarified, and that the true principle of compassion will guide her in her daily labors. This compassion will rub off. It will rub off internationally, interracially. Once people begin to think in terms of a natural respect for each other, the whole history of the world will change. Now, 50% or more, a little more than 50% from the recent statistics, of the population of the earth is women. These women represent probably close to 3 billion human beings. These 3 billion human beings possess an internal sensitivity they are born with. They are naturally closer to life than men. They are naturally more involved in the mysteries of generation and regeneration than men. Their entire equipment fits them to make the greatest contribution to progress of either sex. And they are outnumbering men and are gradually gaining greater and greater recognition in every field. If over half the population instinctively, internally wants peace, actually realizes the danger of war, feels in its own heart the pain and suffering and misery of com competition and destruction, if over half the world wants peace and is founded in a philosophy of love and faith, is actually endowed with a mercy beyond that of the opposite sex. If this is true, the, such, the situation can be solved. There is no reason why that part of life which carries its greatest ideals should be powerless to take any positive effect in the situation. It is perfectly possible for women to end war. They can do it if they want to, because they have the majority. And they also have intangible psychological forms and instruments of achievement, which men do not have. They also have the possibility of visualizing and dreaming from within themselves, especially in the hours and days in which they are carrying life in their own bodies. They can dream of a world better than anything we know. And with over three billion of them to do it, why is it so slow? Why is all this not being done? Is it because women have not as high an estimation of themselves as men have of them? Is it because for some unknown reason they believe that love and faith are not strong enough to take care of hate? Do they believe that religion is too weak to work against economics and competition? Are they so uh, uh, structured that they believe that they can live in comparative peace with maybe a half of the world hungry? And what are these things that are retarding the most powerful force we have in the world today? A force that has been neglected, a force that has not been brought into focus, a force against which almost every vice we know would have to fall. This is something that seems to be very needed. And it's very possible that the, the present trend, which is definitely a feministic trend, has this at the root of itself. This is the, the fact that can be and restored as it was of old. 
5,000 years ago, women ruled the world and ruled nearly every institution of mankind. Now they have difficulty ruling anything, including themselves. It cannot go on like this. Here we have not a treaty, not somebody signing a pledge, not a meeting, group of people meeting to try to outlaw difficulties between Ethiopia and some other country. We have a tremendous force internally aware of the great need of love internally aware of the importance of peace, internally aware of the fact that it does not want its sons to go to war and die. It does not want its daughters uh, to fall into negative patterns that have no permanent value. These people can and should be the leaders of tomorrow. They should help us to make peaceful the lands in which we live. And our education for young women today should definitely include very definite training in idealism, integrities, and the highest form of the recognition of the dignity of themselves. That they are not second-rate citizens and never were. They have always invisibly, visibly, or psychologically ruled the world. Now the time comes for them to unite to make certain that a better world goes on than we have had up to the present time. It is largely in their keeping. Some will say men have failed. Well, probably they have. The failure of men is bad, but the failure of woman is worse. Because with her, if she fails, all hope for security, peace, and ultimate intelligent conduct all go together. So it is very necessary today for every person to try either to increase insights, increase understanding, or increase faith, and to become more and more capable of handling all these little irritating, nagging things which have divided people for so long. This is no time for division. This is a time for unity. The unity of effort. And I think we will find that when it is placed on the proper level, we're going to get a great deal of cooperation. Both men and women are willing and can work together. They can build together. If they have dreams, they can dream together. And there's a very poor man, indeed, who will not rise to his wife's dreams if she makes them clear and honest. We can also do much in the making of public opinion we can become individually more expressive of the values we believe in. We can do much to change the entertainment field. We can do much to change the literary field of the moment. We can get the degeneracy out of our modern way of life if we want to. And the power to do that is in the understanding woman who knows what it means to do it wrong and who also has the power always to correct the faults of her own kind and also the faults of men. These points are coming up. We are getting very close to the time when some of these facts are going to have to be faced. We are now at a time when every situation that we know of has come to a dead end. We are not getting anywhere. Now, we're not going to achieve this by simply electing women to a public office. They're entitled to it. No one doubts it. But that's not going to answer it if they keep on running the way the men ran it. We're going to be right where we were. <laughs> so the effort of a woman to succeed by being liking, like a man is a dead loss to her and to the world. She has got to do the thing that she alone can do. And that is dignify the internal values of life. She is the one who must emphasize those basic spiritual values which are the substance of religion. Well, men talk about religion and a lot of them try hard to live according to it. Religion is probably the most powerful force in the life of woman. But this religion cannot be sectarian. It cannot be competitive or combative. 
It can't be constantly involved in internal strife and struggle. Religion must be the internal awareness of all, of all people of the rules of the game. It must be the recognition of the essential reason for being here, and that is to come to understand the power that put us here. The reason for being here and how we can fulfill the unfinished business of the ages. With this type of thinking, we're going to get somewhere. We're going to find that a unique contribution will come in. And as we think back over history and study the matter, we will realize that wherever that contribution appeared even for a little while, it made a unique improvement in humankind. It was a tremendous constructive force. But in the course of time and the rising of material ambitions and material aspirations, the essentials have been forgotten. But here we come, and I think Nostradamus was one of the prophets who pointed out that near the end of the present century, there must be a great and major change. That it may be preceded by a great cataclysm of some kind, maybe not. He hoped it wouldn't be. But the world wasn't going to end because he says that at the beginning of the 21st century, the paraclete will come. Now, the word paraclete means the peaceful. There is going to be a resurgent of, in, of uh, life in which the divine plan and the divine purpose will be restored. It will be a time when all governments and all ways of life will begin to pay honor and tribute to the immutable principles upon which existence stands. And at that time, the Prince of Peace, or the Princes of Peace, may come. But whatever it is, the great change is one thing and one thing only. It is the change, the shift, from fear to faith, from hate to love, and from error to truth. We cannot build on any other foundation. And of all the values that we have that we need most, these values are associated particularly with women. They have always been hymned and sung in these respects. They have been worshipped in a strange way, generation after generation, by men who never understood them. But they have still been held and are still regarded as the most powerful force in the world. Now, the problem is to try to use that force without going, let going to your heads and making them the new conquerors. This won't do. The new thing is very great, namely, that the love of life, the love of the divine, the love of realities and truths will conquer them, and they will live peacefully, happily, successfully, and with all the needs of life because they have put the world into a better order to carry on its duties and responsibilities. There is this point which I think we need to basically remember, that there is a purpose of things as they are. The old story of Adam and Eve had a meaning, and that meaning has got to be gradually restored. The interpretation given in the popular mind is not the true meaning. The true meaning is that these two together, representing a unit, uh, the Adam and Eve being the two divisions of human life, not people, the, the great divisions of human life, that from generation to generation got into trouble, must come back again as the great progenitors who will lead the way to once more into the garden of the Lord. This world is a garden. It should be a garden. Women love gardens. They love to raise flowers and a few vegetables and a little fruit now and then. They enjoy it. This whole world is a garden. And if we stop wrecking it, we can have it. But we have gotten into the habit of watching it for a minute and then selling it off for a profit. We have definitely sold our birthrights for bowls of pottage. We have done everything for profit and not for principle. We have failed to realize that the greatest profit arises from principle. 
Now, all these natural virtues, being so sumptuously feminine and being so recognized by both men, that they are the great leaders of life, the things that make life worthwhile, make living not an accident or a disaster, but a friendship and companionship and comradeship down through the years. The realization of this, if applied and expanded, can end forever the problems of war and hate and crime. There is no reason why utopia shouldn't be a reality. There is no reason why people who can educate themselves into all the skills that we have cannot further that education until they reach the condition where they can live together in peace. All these things are coming, and when the times and decisions arise, it's be wonderful to know that we get a solid vote of confidence uh, from the women of the world and that they're going to stand up and say this is the way it must be. Not because we order it that way. Not because we're going to carry the munitions or going to get hold of the bombs. But because there is something stronger than, every, than all these things. And that is simply love. And that is the particular power with which women have been endowed by the universe and by God. And by using it, they will discover that the love of God is the love for God. And that all together, we are one creation, trying to think it through from a man's standpoint, trying to feel it through from a woman's standpoint. Bring the thought and feeling together, and we got something. But while we leave them divided the way they are, they all land in the divorce court. This should not be. So on this particular occasion of Mother's Day, it would seem to be appropriate to say that we are all going to pull together to see that whether men or women, we cannot exemplify the great virtues of womanhood, faith, love, kindness, and sympathy. If we can both, men and women, develop these factors, we will have a world in which wisdom is balanced with love, where strength is balanced by mercy. And these two factors, forever working together in harmony, will give us that golden time we look for. Happy Mother's Day.